What I do, what I do, what I do. grateful to be in your presence and to share this amazing message with all of you. We are living in remarkable times. It is my sincerest belief that we as a species are now entering a new realm of human consciousness, a new realm of awareness, which was pretty much once only theoretical has now grown into the practical. We're living in a time where we have the ability for massive human connection, technological innovation, and a growing awareness of the interconnectedness of all things. Uh, I know some of you in this room, uh, but I don't know all of you, so for those of us who haven't met yet, my name is Rebecca Powers. I am a envirapreneur, eco-blogger, and also an activist based out of Central Texas. I am on a mission to liberate humanity from the electric grid and also cure humanity's addiction to fossil fuels. So it's kind of overwhelming, but um, in order to achieve these goals, right now I serve as the executive director of the Center for Natural Living, which is a 501c3 public charity founded in 2012. And we are on a mission to co-create a voluntary and natural world. I'm so excited to present later on after um, going through some of the theoretics of this presentation, one of the projects that we're working on called the Sustainable and Autonomous Communities Initiative. Our goal is to research and share and pave a path for eco-villages and intentional communities or autonomous towns or free private cities or even seasteads, hey, <laughs> um, to share the best practices and also to provide them the resources that they need in order to thrive and succeed. Some are in startup phase, some are well established. Um, okay, so moving forward, Buckminster Fuller is absolutely extraordinary. He's a tremendous influence. And he says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing obsolete, right? It's kind of like Italians are like, make a monopoly you can't refuse. <laughs> you know, I look at that with government. Like, what if we could just build something better with alternative institutions? Um, so my background is in not only free market think tank policy and campaign work, um, but the last half decade, I actually worked with a startup company in the natural products industry. Don't mean to toot my own horn, but we kind of went from a farmer's market company to a multi-million dollar corporation. So I have a, a little bit of expertise in regard to scaling things. And um, while I was with this company, one of my largest takeaways were all of the different trade shows that I went to in the natural products industry, massive innovations and in product packaging, um, commitments from companies to have ethical sourcing of ingredients, to create products that um, helped the local economies grow. And it was just super inspiring to see like these people are doing these things and consumers are buying these products for a reason, not just because they're awesome products, but also because they're making the world a better place. And so I'm not here to discuss uh, the problems. I'm more interested in the solutions. And I want everyone to take a step back and just kind of think of the interconnectedness of our economy and also the you know, ecology and our world. And we are part of the bigger natural world, right, as humans. And so how can we live within and communicate without and live a lifestyle that's in alignment with nature and is in harmony with nature and that really serves the earth. It's not in our best interest to rape the earth or deprave it or whatever of its resources. So how do we find a nice balance so that everyone is happy and flourishing? Here are some sexy, sustainable solutions that I've come up with. <laughs> and so I'm going to go through a few slides that really go more into detail about these ideas. And so the first is my absolute favorite, which is permaculture, permanent agriculture or permanent culture. Permaculture is so inspiring. And I see more and more people living this lifestyle. And so it's not using government to force things, it's literally people opting in voluntarily. 
And so um, when we think of permaculture, we can think of it in terms of working with nature, not against it, okay? We're doing things to work with nature so that it is um, mutually beneficial for all parties and, and all beings. The history of permaculture is pretty interesting. It's a fairly new concept, although if you really think about it, people and Earth have been living this forever, just didn't have a lingo or you know title associated with it. And so what I really am interested in is the implications that it will have on ecological design, um, ecological engineering, regenerative design, and also um, how we're going to have more sustainable agriculture. I'm super fascinated with like net zero buildings and people who are building home structures that are uh, consuming or producing just as much energy as they're consuming. Okay, so a lot of like lefties are into this whole movement, but I really think anarchists ought to care as well. Um, the three main ideas really resonate with a lot of anarchist principles and our ethos. And part of that's like radical self-reliance. Um, but the main tenets of permaculture, earth care, people care, fair share. So it kind of goes without saying, like, how do you want to live your life? Do you want to live it with, you know, in alignment with nature or be fighting against it? And so I'm interested in the patterns that affording that sort of lifestyle and opportunity. And I love this meme. This is like, uh, duh, permaculture is the best. And like, not only is it going to save the world, but you're working with nature. So it makes things easier, <laughs> right? Why like work harder than you need to work smarter, not harder. So another beautiful aspect of permaculture's whole systems design, and you can look at this as like, how is everything interconnected? I love it when Derek Rose speaks about holistic anarchism because it's like, how is all of this coming together and this interconnectedness of all of these different topics, whether it's culture, political, economy, ecology, it's all connected, right? So how can we move forward and in alignment with that? Michael Strong lives in Central, well, he used to live in Central Texas, so I had the pleasure of spending some time with him, and he has this idea called radical entrepreneurship. And this is really what inspired me as well, working with the natural products company that I was with and seeing how companies were solving these problems, not the government. If the government is anything it's, that it's not, it, it's not creative, it's definitely not efficient, and it's not innovative. But entrepreneurs are, hey. So his um, idea is that radical social entrepreneurs have this amazing opportunity to change the world in ways that the government could never do, could never possibly accomplish. And uh, one really interesting case study, and just to kind of put this into perspective, is a company that I absolutely adore um, called Guayaki Yerba Mate. Maybe some of you have had their tea. Uh, they have something called market-driven restoration. And so they're not extracting from the planet and taking away everything from um, the fields where they're you know, harvesting the supply. They are encouraging the local economy to grow. They're providing jobs. They're replanting. It's regenerative agriculture. And it's in their best interest as a company. Of course, they want to have the economy grow. And of course, they want to replant because they want to have, they have a long-term vested interest in, in, the, in their business, but also in providing their awesome products to their consumers who rely on them. And so the market can and does provide, and you as a consumer can vote with your dollar, so to speak. Every single time that you purchase something, you're supporting it with your energy um, in one way or another. But by purchasing something, you're essentially saying, I'm in favor of this. And if you're in favor of things that are sustainable and regenerative, more things that are sustainable and regenerative will pop up. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> And so um, another interesting thing is that like, we have the opportunity to buy things from our local economy rather than, um, you know, if you're gonna consume, why not support the local economy, farmers markets? And I really think the concept of um, thinking global but acting locally is really important. And um, as it says in the very end there, long before governments began enforcing environmental laws, individuals were coming together to protect habitats and the organisms that live within them. And so this is just a voluntary approach to a more cooperative sort of living style and alternative lifestyle. And then we approach into dun, 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 blockchain. There's like blockchain for everything nowadays. It's kind of overwhelming. But I want to go through a few that I'm super excited about. I'm not saying that these are all live right now. Some of them may only be like conceptual or like the very beginnings of these companies. But like, 
it blows my mind. I'm in this blockchain for ecology group on Telegram. I don't know if anyone in here uses Telegram. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, you're in it too. <laughs> and it's great. Like people post the most profound things, and I'm just learning something new every single day. Um, so this one blew my mind, and I connected with this guy. He's like, "How can I help your nonprofit?" And I'm like, "Well, we want to do rainwater collection." He's like, "Yeah, Internet of Rain." Rain on the blockchain, you know, rainwater collection organized that way. And he's like coming up with a way to actually do this and distribute it in a way that's voluntary and regenerative. And it's just super inspiring. Um, D Life, I had the pleasure of speaking with Jan a few times on the phone. I'm not totally sure where this project is at. They were going to build in the Cayman Islands, but it's like a peer to peer neighborhood. I believe they're structuring it as a condo association, and everything's organized on the blockchain. So like your wallet, like the food supply, it's just kind of profound to think like we can utilize this technology in our advantage so that we're doing more with less and doing so in style. Um, ubiquity, so now you can have a land title transfer uh, on the blockchain and you kind of squash the middleman for real estate agents and it makes it super efficient for real estate and purchasing property. Oh, my friend Ross was telling me, he was also in the Blockchain for Ecology group, about his company he's working with now, Nori, um, and I'm fairly new to this one, but they're interested in carbon monoxide and how can the um, economy work with uh, reducing emissions. And So I don't totally know how this one rolls out, but a lot of smart people are on board and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is a way to you know really honor the environment, but doing so voluntarily and not through coercion or coercive policy. And then um, Holochain is different than blockchain, but they're doing some really exciting things too. It's not live yet from what I understand, but they um, have a lot of ideas on how there could be like an interconnection of all of these different topics. Here's a quick visual. Um, so land development, ecotech, education, water, food, energy. It's a little bit overwhelming, but also super exciting because I believe wholeheartedly that if we utilize this technology in an efficient way, it could really accelerate our desire to live off grid or our desire to live um, in community. Um, a more intensive use for resources. It rains, why not harvest the rainwater? Um, there's abundant amount of sun, why not have solar panels, right? Wind, like it, I guess it just depends on where you live, but why are we not tapping into these awesome um, opportunities today, right now? Probably because existing infrastructure makes it um, where there's less of an incentive, but if you're building something new, why not have a net zero home where you never have an electricity bill ever again? Like how liberating is that, you know, to detach yourself? If an um, environmental disaster happens, you're set. You're harvesting your own energy. You're growing your own food. Like, it's just, whoa. If we want to be sovereign people and self-sufficient and radical self-reliance, then this ought to be a lifestyle that we care about, not just for the environment, but for ourselves and our community. OK, and then decentralizing all the things. Uh, in the past, it's been like a very hierarchical sort of structure, top-down, doesn't work very well. And so um, the behavior ought to change so that we diminish our reliance on those sort of systems. Uh, and now, my favorite topic. <laughs> I don't know if there's like, have you guys heard of the 100th monkey concept? Yeah. Okay, I don't know what is happening right now, but people are retrogating and I, I'll, like all sorts of buddies of mine and friends are like, Okay, who's gonna buy the land? When are we gonna start building? When are we gonna start developing? Do you wanna live with me? Are we gonna be partners in this? Like, there's this huge demand right now to grow intentional community and eco-villages and to cooperate with one another. And it's just super exciting to me because I see like this as a lifestyle. Like, we're here for this conference right now for three or four days, but this could be like every day of our life. It could be around other people that we love and like learn from and grow with. And <laughs> There's a lot of potential there. And um, the whole purpose of this speech was to discuss how we can co-create a voluntary and natural world. And I sincerely believe that this is going to happen through decentralized approaches to community like seasteading, like special economic zones, like free private cities, intentional communities, eco-villages. And I'm interested in proliferating these sort of communities so that more people can detach themselves from the electric grid, live a more self-sufficient lifestyle, and connect with the earth and one another. 
So a beautiful thing as well, I keep saying a beautiful thing, but I'm just really inspired by all these topics, um, is that it's happening. It's happening already. There's loads of intentional communities all over the world. There's special economic zones in China and India. Like this is happening right now. I want more of it, you know? <laughs> it's exciting. Um, a case study, so in December, uh, we visited Charan. Uh, they're going to have a speech tomorrow, the community elder will, and we're also going to have a workshop, which all of you were invited to, because we're learning from them. They're living this right now. In 2011, they had an uprising. If you're not familiar with their story, it's incredibly inspiring. They kicked out all the politicians, burned up the trucks of all the loggers, because there were illegal logging operations happening with the cartel, and the illegal loggers of the municipal government were all collusion. And they said, Bastia, enough is enough. And so we'll be looking at what they've created because it's really inspiring. And you can't even run for office in their town. They have 18,000 people. Can you imagine that? They have a consensus-based, voluntary, sort of decentralized approach. It's really, really fascinating. And so I invite all of you to attend the workshop tomorrow at 7 p.m. And I hope that you'll attend his speech as well as actually closing out the conference. And so. You know, we talk about anarchy, but these people are living anarchy. How inspiring. These are a few pictures from our visit. Um, they're replanting all of the uh, forests, regenerative agriculture. We got to see all of their greenhouses. And um, they're not like off the grid, they're still tapped in. But it's pretty inspiring still to see what they've created and what they're working toward. And they're doing so without law, without coercion. And again, 18,000 people. Wow. Like, it's mind blowing. And so we, we can do this in other places. We ought to. We need to. Um, I'm just touching on some of the topics that are here at this conference, hoping that most people are familiar with this. Liberland, they're like creating their own country full of anarchist libertarians. I believe it's near Croatia or something along those lines in Europe. And so that's happening right now. And they're like even having workshops here about how to have e-residency and to become a part of that community. The Free State Project in New Hampshire is a thing um, where they're getting all the more encouraging people to move there who are libertarian or anarchists um, so that people can get elected into office and change that way. They also have a lot of eco-villages there. Uh, special economic zones, again, these are already happening all over the world, and they're like massive economic booms. Like, it's incredible, it's so inspiring. If you're like really driven by Austrian economics and economic prosperity, then Special Economic Zones and Startup Societies Foundation is doing great work with this as well. Um, seasteading! I love seasteading. I don't live on the ocean, you know? <laughs> Whoa, like, how cool would that be? So if you don't like your neighbors, you can just be like, back Felicia, and like float over to the other like floating <laughs> pot. It's amazing. And uh, my friend Carly Rose is working with them. Joe Quirk's great. He's going to be speaking as well at this conference. So I encourage you to attend his speech. And um, I have had a hard time totally connecting with the intentional communities sort of movement because there's like a lot of socialists and people who have a different economic perspective as I do, but I'm empathetic and deeply compassionate and I always want to learn and I'm you know, open-minded and so I've been actually building an alliance with a handful of individuals within the Fellowship for Intentional Community and Global Eco Village Network. And to me it's not so much about our, dis, uh, our, our you know, conf conflicting perspectives on economics, uh, because if they want their eco village to be socialist, that's cool. I'm not going to do that, but you know that's cool. I want mine to have like ownership incorporated and to have equity in the community. Um, but we have so much in common. It's like let's focus on the 95% of things that we have in common. So that's what I've been doing. And I had the pleasure of meeting a handful of them at a regenerative collab in Arizona just a few months ago at Arcosanti, which is like arcology and super inspiring place with passive heat and cooling. And um, they call it an unintentional community in a permanent construction zone. But anyway, the Fellowship for Intentional Community is absolutely incredible. They have a huge listing of intentional communities all over the world. They have data that is so intricate. It's like, here's how many people live here. Are you accepting new members? Here's our spiritual beliefs. Here's our dietary restrictions. Like, you can learn almost anything that you want to learn about the intentional communities on their directory. It is fascinating. So I encourage anyone who wants to visit an intentional community or learn more about them to visit their directory or to check out New Mundo, which is kind of like, I pitch it as the Airbnb of intentional communities and eco-villages, although it's much more, I'm sure David could tell you, but, <laughs> but New Mundo is really freaking cool too. And it's like, oh my gosh, you can just go live that lifestyle for a few nights and kind of check in and check out if you want to. 
Um, yeah, so the Global Eco Village Network is also really cool. Um, they have conferences all over the world. They just created an alliance in North America called Jenna Global Eco Village Network North America. And it's bringing together a lot of these organizations and individuals so that we can have like data aggregation and um, connection so that we can build more community and help these communities thrive. And so just in case y'all didn't know what an eco village was, I wanted to touch on that briefly. So there's like four main concepts that the Global Eco Village Network um, focuses in on. And so there's economic sustainability, worldview and cultural sustainability, social sustainability, and also ecological sustainability. So it's a different way of looking at the world so that maybe it is more leftist, but it's voluntary. You don't have to like, you know, tune into it if you don't want to. But if you're gonna live in an eco village, something tells me that you have the inkling to connect with others and maybe have a more like contractual sort of relationship and a reliance on your neighbors and you know community building. So economic sustainability, eco villages work to build economic systems that contribute to sharing of resources, mutual support, and strong local networks that serve the needs of people and ecosystems. The worldview, eco villages aim to build or regenerate diverse cultures that support people to empower and care for each other, their communities, and the planet. Sound good so far? Social sustainability. Eco villages are communities in which people feel supported by and responsible to those around them, ideally with people you love. And ecological sustainability. Eco villages provide for their daily needs of food, shelter, water, and energy while respecting the cycles of nature. I don't know how much more sovereign or anarchist it gets than that. Um, but if I'm going to be doing this and living this lifestyle and style, I want to be doing it with friends and people that I love and working together and co-creating. So that's what I'm doing. And right now, I'm the executive director of the Center for Natural Living. So to tie it back into my projects, everyone loves to talk about themselves, right? Uh, we have some really exciting projects in the works. I'm not sure exactly how quickly we're going to jump into everything. It really depends on the funding. We're building a network. I'm grant writing right now. We would love to have some donations if you want to support our cause. Here's what we're up to. Our long-term goal is clear. We would like to see a sustainable world full of autonomous communities living in peaceful coexistence. In order to do this, we are embarking upon what we call the Sustainable and Autonomous Communities Initiative Tour. The first stop was Chiron. I can't even think of a better place to have visited for the first stop. It was so inspiring, so amazing. And we want to visit more communities that are doing this so that we can research what they're doing well. We want to film it so that we can share their stories with the world. And we also want to reach out to them beforehand so that we can understand what community projects they're working on and perhaps build cross-sector partnerships with rainwater collection companies or earthship builders or solar panel companies or gravel companies so the road can be improved upon. Whatever it may be, every single community has its own unique needs and projects and desires. And so we're interested in visiting these startups, whether they're brand new or well-established communities to learn from them and also have them learn from us. Um, three of our individuals who are associated with the Center for Natural Living um, are on large chunks of land already. Two of our board members own land in Central Texas and I'm living on a 50 acre property and so our main focus is Central Texas, but we also have aspirations to visit other communities in Kansas City where they have the Sovereign Living Center. In Ohio where there's Crooked Mouth Farm, who uh, his name's Chris, he does the Laissez Faire magazine. Um, we also would like to visit New Hampshire because we'll be speaking at Porkfest um, and sharing our insights there. And there's so many really cool eco villages in New Hampshire. There's this one where they like have a solar panel company. So cottage industry is really cool. I'm fascinated by entrepreneurship. But they all drive like Teslas and they're super stylish. Like that's the kind of eco village I want to hang out with. <laughs> so that's the goal for Saki. And um, again, we're starting in Central Texas. And if we secure the funding, we will travel to these other places. We would also like to go to Italy to go see Dom and her, and also go to the Global Eco Village Network Conference and network with all those super cool people. And they have their conference in July. Berlin? What was that? In Berlin? No, it's in Italy, and I can't remember what part, but we could probably Google that <laughs> at the end which we're almost at. Um, so when I say sustainable and autonomous communities, this is what we're going for, okay? So we're looking for communities that have like-minded individuals, voluntary, contractual, 
autonomous, this would be people who are, you know, self-determination, like, we're not wanting to be subjected to any sort of coercive policies. And so um, that's the aspiration for the Sustainable Autonomous Communities Initiative, studying what they're doing right, researching, sharing their stories, and ideally providing resources so that they can flourish. And then, oh, I'll just run my out. Okay, and then we also have a docu reality show, which there are four episodes right now. Only one has been released online. And our intention is to film while we go on this tour and also while we build up community in Central Texas so that um, people can share their stories of how they're living a lifestyle that's more sovereign. And um, if you would like to see the first episode, it's on YouTube. Also at the end of my speech, please come visit me and you can sign up on our email list and we're going to do like a drip campaign sort of thing where the other episodes will be released. Cool. Okay, and then lastly, Amaji Living. Amaji is like the first written hieroglyphic for the um, concept of freedom. It literally translates to return to the mother. So we had an idea of doing workshops where it's primarily about property acquisition, net zero energy, um, contractual community, and we have thankfully been invited to some cool conferences like Anarchapulco, Paleo FX, and we're lining it up for Porkfest as well so that we can talk about these ideas at these awesome conferences with awesome people like you. So we hope that you will join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for a workshop with the Chadan community so that we can learn from them. It's called Community Unchained. It says that it's $25, but whatever. <laughs> Suggested donation would be cool so that we can go to them. But anywho, I hope to see you all there. And I hope that you will help us join or join us in um, co-creating a more voluntary and national world. Thank you. Rebecca Powers, one more time, please.